turn to John 3.16 as we talk this morning about God's greatest gift. God's greatest gift to you is the gift of eternal life. There was a time when you were not. When Moses received the Ten Commandments, you were not. Whenever Rome ruled the world, you were not. When America's founding fathers penned the Constitution of the United States, you were not. But there will never be a time from this moment forward that you will not be somewhere. You're either going to live forever in the glory and splendor of heaven or to live in outer darkness for all eternity. God's Son, Jesus Christ, has given to you and to those who are watching by television the marvelous gift of peace, peace that surpasses all understanding. He has given to us joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. Divine healing is for every disease and sickness. God has given to us breathtaking prosperity. And if you don't feel that you're prosperous, just travel the world a little bit and you will find out how hilariously prosperous we are as Americans. God has given to us hope for the future. He has given to us a mansion in heaven. He has given to us eternal life. But the question is, have you received God's blessing? Have you received God's greatest gift? Jesus Christ, his son. Read with me John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Father God, we've come to your house today to worship Jesus Christ, born in a manger, the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, the hope of glory, the friend that sticketh closer than a brother, God's greatest gift. Let us receive it today with joy that we have such a pleasure of knowing Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's children said amen. amen. You may be seated. The greatest gift is the story of a child that was born in a cave to a virgin named Mary, contrary to the laws of nature. The child lived in poverty and was reared in obscurity. He did not travel extensively. Only once did he cross the boundary of the country in which he lived, and that was during his childhood as he and his parents fled from Herod who was trying to kill him. He possessed neither wealth nor influence. His relatives were inconspicuous. They were not influential. They had neither training nor education. In infancy, he startled a king. In childhood, he puzzled the doctors in the temple. In manhood, he ruled the course of nature. He walked on the seas of Galilee as though it were pavement. The hushed sea slept in the raging storm when he said, peace, be still. He healed the multitudes without medicine, and he made no charge for his service. He never wrote a book, yet all the libraries of the world cannot contain the books that have been written about him. He never wrote a song, and yet he has furnished the theme for more songs than all the songwriters combined. He never founded a college, but all the schools put together cannot boast of having as many students. He never practiced medicine, and yet he has healed more broken hearts than all the doctors in all of the world. He never marshaled an army. He never drafted a soldier. He never fired a gun, and yet millions have followed him and found peace that surpasses understanding. Every seventh day, the wheels of commerce cease their turning as the multitudes find their way to a place of worship to bow their knee to the Lord Jesus Christ, 
The names of past proud statesmen of Greece and Rome have come and gone, but the name of Jesus Christ still lives with abundant life and glory. Though time has spread 2,000 years plus between our generation and the scene of his crucifixion, Jesus Christ still lives. He is still Lord. He is victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Give the Lord praise in the house. Christmas is the celebration of a child. Isaiah wrote in 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. The name of Jesus is above every name by accomplishment. All high-sounding titles which earthly leaders give to themselves are really there to gratify their vanity and their ego. Alexander the Great is a high-sounding title to a man who died at the age of 32, most likely from a sexual disease. He was not great. He couldn't conquer himself. Herod the Great, that's a title you hear all over the Middle East. Herod the Great is a lofty title for a man who murdered nine of his ten wives on the mere suspicion that they may have been unfaithful. Think about that. He demanded that his only son be executed on the day of his death so Israel would have a reason to mourn. Great? He was a great builder, but he was a maniacal murderer. He is not a great man. He had a lofty title, but he was a cold-blooded killer. Today he is screaming for mercy in the fires of hell. Herod the Great? I think not. There is one man who walked across the stage of human history whose greatness is greater than human tongue can tell. He is the great I am. He is the great physician. He is the great shepherd who guides and provides for his sheep. Never in human history was there child born a living God from the womb of a virgin, but Jesus Christ was. Never in human history was there a man wounded by Satan, yet who crushed and defeated Satan, but Jesus Christ did that at the cross for you and for you and for you. Never in human history was there one who was the Savior of men, but allowed himself to be crucified by men, but Jesus did. Never was there a man who died and was buried and rose again on the third day, just like he said he would, but Jesus did. I have been to the tomb of Abraham. He is still there. I've been to the tomb of David. He is still there. I have been to the tomb of Jesus. It is empty. The tomb of Jesus is the only tourist attraction in Israel where people line up to see nothing. Jesus is incarnate wisdom. He was called a fool. Jesus was the king of glory, yet he wore a crown of thorns. Jesus was the truth, yet he was called by the public and the Pharisees a liar and a hypocrite and a demonized heretic. Don't you ever believe that you're going to make a bold stand for Jesus and everyone is going to love you? The devil's crowd is not timid about speaking up about their convictions. Why should we be? Amen. Jesus was the Lion of Judah, yet he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He spoke with authority who poured all of the rivers and the oceans out of the crystal chalice of eternity. Yet when he was on the cross, he cried, I thirst. The man who permitted all of the water on the planet thirst at the cross. Jesus Christ is our joy. He is our hope. He is our salvation. He is our king. But the question is, do you know him? Do you love him? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Do you serve him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and body? Have you accepted God's greatest gift, 
The fact is, the Bible says every knee will bow. He is here right now in this building. Emmanuel, God with us. He walks the aisles of this assembly. He is calling your name. He will save you because there is no other name given among men whereby we might be saved. He will heal you because he is the great physician. He will deliver you for whom the Son sets free is free indeed. He will comfort you. He will give you joy in the midst of the night. He has the answers to every question of your life. He has the peace that you're searching for. He has joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. Christ is the answer for the problems you've been trying to solve. Shout hallelujah, brother. Our king lives. He rules. He reigns. And he's coming back soon with power and great glory. 1 Peter 2 and 7, unto you therefore which believe he is precious. To those of you who believe he is precious. Jesus is precious for what he has done. He says, on this rock have I built my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is the rock of our salvation. He is the cornerstone. That's why we named this church the Cornerstone Church. Gates in this verse refer to the government, the government of Satan. In Bible times, the rules of the city set at the gates of the city. All of the affairs of the city took place at the gates. At Calvary, he conquered the powers and principalities of the kingdom of darkness. When he bowed his head and shouted, it is finished, he descended into hell and he introduced himself to Satan and his demonic legions as the lion of the tribe of Judah, as the lamb of God, and as the conqueror from Calvary. He announced that from this day forward, when my children come to the gates of this place, Place and use my name. You tremble with fear because they have authority over you. You obey them instantly because they are part of the kingdom of God. They have received God's greatest gift. They are victorious over you. We pray God's word has blessed you today through our telecast. I want you to stay tuned to the end of today's program when I'm going to pray a blessing over you. But first, we have this special resource just for you. Pastor John Hagee has dedicated over 65 years of his life to ministry, sharing the gospel with unwavering commitment. From the pulpit to a global ministry, Pastor Hagee has been a beacon of hope and faith. Through changing seasons, he has remained steadfast in his conviction to spread the message of God's love and salvation. Trust in the loving Savior who performs miracles every day and see him transform your life. For your gift of any amount, we will send you a unique 65 years commemorative coin and prayer journal. For your gift of $265 or more, you will also receive a Joshua 2415 tile art and a commemorative book celebrating Pastor Hagee's 65 years in ministry. Take refuge in the word and he will give his angels charge over you. To give your special year-end tax-deductible gift today, call the number on your screen or visit jhm.org slash honor. Jesus is precious for what he will soon do. Very soon he's going to come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Instantly the trump of God shall sound. The dead from all over the earth will rise and we will meet the Lord in the air as the church of Jesus Christ leaves planet earth for mansions on high. It's going to be a glorious day. It's going to be a glorious day. The coming of Jesus Christ is imminent. There is not one prophetic thing that needs to be fulfilled before he's coming. What are we going to do there? For seven years, we're going to have the marriage supper of the Lamb, the greatest Mexican fiesta you've ever seen in your life. At the end of seven years, here's what's going to happen. Listen, because some of you are going to see this. Jesus is going to return to the city of Jerusalem with all of the body of Christ 
mounted on a white horse. This is in the book of Revelation for those of you who think I'm making this up as I go. <laughs> mounted on a white horse. John the Revelator says, and his garments are dipped in blood. Blood of who? As soon as Jesus comes back, it will be at the battle of Armageddon and he is going to destroy all of those people who have come to attack Israel. He is going to annihilate them on a battlefield that's 180 miles long. Then he is coming back to the city of Jerusalem and put his foot on the Mount of Olives. It's going to split in half and there is going to be an enormous earthquake in which the heavens open and the new Jerusalem comes down and sets as the capital of the kingdom of the living God on this earth. The lion will lay down with the lamb. Men will beat their swords into plowshares and study war no more. King Jesus is going to rule planet earth by this precious book. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The Bible says he should save his people. Jesus is not going to save everyone. He's just going to save his people. This is a statement of limitation. Is salvation for everyone? No. It's only to those who believe. The Bible says he that believeth on me has eternal life. And he that believeth not is dead already. Going to church does not save you. It's believing on the Lord Jesus that saves you. It's receiving him as God's precious gift. Have you a husband, a wife, a son, a daughter who does not believe? In the eyes of God, they are dead already because you're not really living until you know the Lord. He shall save his people. It's a statement of prophecy and passion. Prophecy because it guaranteed salvation. Satan's objective is to destroy every person on earth. But the Bible says Jesus shall save. People say, preacher, I've sinned too deep to be saved. That's a demonic lie. He shall save from the guttermost to the uttermost. He can save. Call upon me and I I will answer you and show you great and mighty things you know not. <laughs> Isaiah 45, 22, look unto me and be ye saved to the ends of the earth. Listen to that. Think about what it says. Look unto me, Jesus is saying, and be saved to the ends of the earth. Most people think that is geographically far off from God. It means far removed from God, the lowest of the low center. It's the prodigal in the pig's pen covered with the stench of swine. You are as far away from the word of God as you can get. It means the casual Christian who's sitting in America's churches singing about a heaven you're not ever going to see. You're religious and lost. You're having a form of godliness, but you're denying the power thereof. The Bible says, though your sins be of scarlet, they can be as white as snow. They will be buried in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered against you anymore. Blood has a strange chemistry. Human blood stains, but the blood of Jesus Christ washes whiter than snow. Think about that. When you receive the Lord, the blood of Christ is spilled over your record in heaven. It is expunged and made crimson white, totally white. 1 John 1 and 7, the blood of Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. How much sin? All sin. All sin. His blood will set you free because his blood saves his people. Those of you watching this television, have you given your heart and life to Jesus Christ because he is God's greatest gift? The name that is above every name is a strong tower. Proverbs 18.10 says, The Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. There are four pictures in the Bible that reflect 
how God is a strong tower to his children. I have time for only one. It's the picture of Abraham climbing Mount Moriah with his son Isaac. Only Abraham knows they're climbing the mountain to sacrifice Isaac to the Lord. Isaac asked the father, where is the lamb? And Abraham said, Jehovah Jireh. Listen, Jehovah Jireh literally means God can see. The inference is because God can see, he will provide. There is a relationship between vision and provision. Get those two words in your mind. Vision and provision. Let's stay with the literal translation God can see. When Isaac asked Abraham, where is the lamb? Abraham could have said, I can't see. I can't see how God's going to solve this problem. Have you ever said that? Have you ever really gotten into a real jam, a mess, a problem, a personal crisis, and you couldn't see the way out? How many of you have done that? I can't see how God's going to provide for me financially. And let me tell you, with this runaway inflation America has, that's understandable. I can't see how God is going to make a way where there seems to be no way. By faith, Abraham ran into the strong tower of the Lord, and he said, Jehovah Jireh, God can see, God can see, and because he can see, he's going to do something about it. Hear me, God can see what you can't see. God knew the problem was coming long before you even knew it was around. He knew the problem was coming the day you were born. As Abraham and Isaac walked up one side of the mountain, the angel of the Lord is on the other side of the mountain dragging that ram up the hill. Every time Abraham says, Jehovah Jireh, that angel drags that ram. Do you hear what that man is saying over there? That man of faith is saying, God can see. Come on, you're the answer. Abraham tied his son's hand saying, God can see. He lifted his dagger, prepared to take his son's life, and the angel of God stopped him. The Bible says when Abraham looked and saw the ram caught in the thicket by the horns, rams do not get caught in the thicket unless the angel ties them there. If you are in a crisis, God has your answer tied by the horns. Just keep walking up that mountain in faith. Keep moving forward. Keep believing God's going to show up. He will do it. Are you facing a great crisis? Jehovah Jireh, God can see what you can't see. Some of you in this room are facing a business crisis. You have no answer, no clue about how you're going to solve the problem. Run into the high tower and wait on the Lord. Jehovah Jireh, God sees, God sees, God sees. Some of you are facing crisis in your health. There's no answer in sight. Your earthly doctor has no answer, but the great physician he sees, he sees, and he heals. Some of you are facing a crisis in your marriage, in your emotions, your relationships with other people. You don't see an answer in sight. Run into the tower that God has provided because God sees, God sees. At the last moment, you will see what God sees and the answer will come, your answer will be instantaneous and will be total. How many of you in this audience and those of you watching television around the world, you're climbing a steep and rugged mountain of personal hardship and betrayal and healing in your body and you're searching for God's answer. Can I see your hand in this audience? Let me talk to those of you for just a moment who are watching at home. You don't know Jesus. You know about Jesus, but you've never actually confessed him to be the Savior and Lord of your life. He is God's greatest gift, and you're not going to have 
a wonderful life until you know him. You're not going to heaven until you know him. So I want those of you who are home right now watching your television set, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Extend your hand toward the television and say this prayer. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I ask Christ, you to forgive me I ask you to forgive of all of my sin. Of all of my sin. I want you to be my Savior. I want you to be my and my Lord. And my Lord. Today. Today. I confess my sin. I confess my I'm sin. sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for my sin. And I want you to be my redeemer. And I want you to be my redeemer. From this moment forward. From this moment forward. I will serve you. I will serve you. I know that angels will write my name. I know that angels will in the Lamb's name. book of life. In the Lamb's book of life. Because because you are my redeemer. You are my redeemer. And heaven's greatest gift. And heaven's greatest gift. Amen. Amen. You have just received the Lord Jesus Christ. You have just become a child of God. You are on your way to heaven. On Saturday, October 7th, while Israeli citizens celebrated the end of Sukkot, over 1,500 Iran-backed Hamas terrorists wage a coordinated and vicious attack against the nation of Israel. This is our time to show love and generosity for a nation suffering one of its darkest hours. October 7th was the deadliest day in Jewish history since the Holocaust. But make no mistake, Israel is shaken, but it is not defeated. Proceeds raised will address the humanitarian crisis resulting from this massacre. First responders and medical facilities are overwhelmed, and we need your help. Go to jhm.org slash standwithisrael to donate today and show your solidarity for the state of Israel and the Jewish people. Let it be known that Israel, you are not alone. Here at Hagee Ministries, we're excited to announce our digital web platforms that provide you with live streaming services, special messages, and series, all through our video on-demand applications. Our Hagee Ministries channel app is now available on Apple TV, Amazon, and Roku streaming platforms. You can also watch our services live on your favorite social media channels, including YouTube, Facebook, or online at jhm.org watch. You've been watching Hagee Ministries. Looking for more content to help you in your daily walk? Listen to our podcast or subscribe to Hagee Ministries on YouTube. And now, Pastors John and Matt Hagee. This book is the Book of Promise. In its pages are over 8,000 promises for you and your family. When God makes a promise, you can be certain that He will keep it. Paul wrote in Philippians, He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it even to the day of Christ Jesus. Whatever your need is, I encourage you today to dig into God's Word